is the voice of the resistance. As the crisis in Peru intensifies, according to a poll by the Institute for Peruvian Studies, 86% of Peruvians disapprove of Congress. And while 31% approved the work of then-President Pedro Castillo, 61% rejected his administration. This is a sample of the complexity of the social crisis, not only people protesting in the streets, but a deep rejection by the majority to those at the top of fundamental democratic institutions. Acá hay un efectivo policial que ha sido apresado por los manifestantes. Amid protests on rural towns and inner cities, a motion to nullify the vacancy of Pedro Castillo was presented on Congress, citing grave mistakes and inconsistencies, and the fact that Castillo's actions were in response to Congress trying to oust him in the first place. To get a more nuanced analysis of the Peruvian socio political crisis and power struggle, we talked to Javier Torres, a journalist and anthropologist, former secretary of the Coordination for Human Rights. As an anthropologist, he worked for over a decade on the countryside with rural communities. He is a well-known political analyst. He is the director of Noticias Ser, a local independent news outlet. The crisis political peruana, efectivamente, is a the Peruvian political crisis indeed is a strong and very intense dispute for power and control of the government already for several years. This didn't start a week ago, this actually comes from the year 2016, in which for the first time in an election in the last 15 years, a defeated candidate did not recognize the victory of the winner. I am referring to Keiko Fujimori, popular leader of 2016. She did not accept her defeat against Pedro Pablo Kuczynski. She brutally opposed him in Congress. And Kuczynski ended up resigning on corruption charges, but with a totally filibuster majority. Then President Vizcarra assumes this president closed Congress. Then a new Congress was elected, and this Congress ended up removing President Vizcarra as well. We had a great crisis with mobilizations at the national level, but with the epicenter in Lima. And the president that replaced Vizcarra, Mr. Manuel Merino, a congressman, also fell just a week after taking office. Then we had another transitional president, Mr. Sagasti, and thus we arrived at 2021, in which for the second time Keiko Fujimori, upon being defeated, did not accept the results. Not only she did not accept defeat, but she openly denounced a fraud that never existed. This has to be said. And from that point on, we have had several vacancy requests against President Pedro Castillo. So evidently there is a power struggle. On the one hand, the extreme right in Peru, which does not recognize defeat when it occurs. On the other hand, the other responsible for this crisis is former President Pedro Castillo because although he had a very strong opposition in Congress and with some large media corporations, Peru is a presidential regime. In other words, the president can govern and do many things without going through Congress. And unfortunately, the management of Pedro Castillo was terrible. It was not a management where each cabinet that he appointed was able to work. He had several, almost six cabinets under Castillo and more than a hundred ministers. He appoints people who were not qualified for the positions, who had neither the political skills nor the technical skills, and sometimes neither one or the other. And he responds to a power quota logic that can be quite natural in a parliamentary regime or a government that is the product of a political coalition. But the problem is that the distribution of power did not respond to any plan. So in addition to the confrontation of the executive with the legislative, besides that, Castillo had cabinets over and over where the ministers confronted each other. And as I say, he didn't keep his promise. One of the most important was the so-called Second Agrarian Reform, which was a proposal by the president for special attention to Peru's peasant sector, which is a sector that, on top of the crisis, was hit hard by the pandemic. 
y respondió una lógica de por Castillo didn't even do that and I think it's a good example because in that case it didn't have to go through any law that had to be approved by Congress it was a matter of simply implementing public policies and the government did not and this was further aggravated by the fertilizer crisis due to the war in Ukraine and even more so in recent months in Peru because there is a drought there is a problem of lack of rain in the Peruvian highlands which is precisely the region where there is more mobilization and so we still have I would say a struggle for power at the top and at the same time among the citizens an enormous accumulated discontent that is discontent with the political class discontent for the lack of public policies discontent for the ineffectiveness of the government discontent for the economic problems that affected the whole world we had one of the toughest quarantines in the world during the pandemic so all these problems and others that have to do with economic labor and union problems linked to extractive industries all this has been cooking it has been cooking in this sort of a cauldron that has exploded now I will say this is what happened in Peru it's like the accumulation explodes then people go out and call for the closing of Congress which is a great demand in many regions in the country and the polls say so what people are saying is that they are fed up with a political class that does not respond to the needs and demands of the population and that lives isolated in its confrontations between different sectors in the national parliament. This class confrontation reminds me of what happened in Ecuador where there was a decade of struggle of revolts and strikes and from within that instability uh, a new leader came out which was Rafael Correa and who ended up ruling the country for 10 years. Has there been anything similar in Peru out of these revolts? In Peru, precisely one of the manifestations of the political crisis or one of the causes of the political crisis is the lack of leadership. There is not much there at the local political level. I'm thinking of those who competed in the 21 and 2016 elections. They do not have the capacity to assume the representation of those who are mobilizing. Neither those who sympathize with former president uh, Pedro Castillo or those who hold a seat for the formerly ruling party in parliament. Not Perú Libre or any other group like Nuevo Perú. None of their leaders have, I will say, authority or legitimacy over the people who are protesting. Look at a region like Cusco, which is such an important region for Peru. Five congressmen from there who are from different benches have been declared traitors to the Cusco citizens because people consider that they do nothing in favor of the community. So the gap is very big and that's why the protests are decentralized. It's not like all the protests happen at the same time in the same place, right? But every day we see it, a little bit here and a little bit there. In some cases it can last longer as it has happened in Andahuayas province, one of the most affected areas. In others a protest might appear and be disbanded or not, a sensation of anarchy, of misrule. Even President Boluarte herself has not shown a great capacity for crisis management or leadership. We see a person who has not finished settling the job, who has appointed a prime minister who is about to be changed less than a week. That gives you a sample of the nature and the seriousness of the situation. You know, a leader is not clearly visible in Peru. There is not, well, an Evo Morales or a Rafael Correa. There are some who would like to be them, who would like to assume that role, like Arturo Humala a political leader who was imprisoned for so many years. He belonged to a nationalist ideology that some believe is from the left, but is more closer to fascism. Umala wants to shoot everybody against the wall. He's a retired soldier who has just been released after several years in prison, almost 20 years in prison for a rebellion against President Alejandro Toledo. The other day he showed up at the rally and ended up being booed because people didn't want him. So there's a very strong rejection of everything that comes close to politics. Perhaps in the upcoming transitional elections, new leaders could emerge. Look at what happened with Pedro Castillo, a person who had been a figure of an important teachers and union strike in 2017, when he took office with great enthusiasm from popular sectors and, and peasant rural sectors, he showed up an absolute incapacity to rule. So figures can appear, but these figures do not end up having the leadership skills of, for example, someone like Rafael Correa, who you mentioned a moment ago, right?
Not to mention that the potential leader of the country will have to deal with two serious undercurrents. On the one hand, you have the people that elected him, mostly poor, and who requires changes, a lot of changes, that's why they're, they want to call a constitutional assembly. And on the other hand, you have big business and big corporations, you have the big capital, international capital, that doesn't require such changes. They don't want the changes, they want stability, they want to the, the same rules of the game, to say it like that. Um, how can he or she, the potential leader, deal with this? Where do you think the country is going? Well, look, at this moment, it's very difficult to say whether we go into one way or the other. Because although you have an important sector of the population mobilized, you also have another sector that at this moment is rather complaining because they cannot work, they cannot move, and they can't travel. Because we have several airports closed at the moment, because prices are starting to get more expensive, and the danger is that due to this lack of leadership, it ends up being a fight of people against people, which will be the worst outcome. I believe that the scenario is difficult to foresee at the moment. But I think that we all hope that the political actors can reach an exit agreement. And then, changes that are necessary can be proposed, not only to change laws, but above all, how do we get a kind of agreement to have a minimally stable government? Because look, there are indeed problems with big capital in Peru, and there are social conflicts with some big companies. But it's also true that in other regions, big capital works. And what people have are negotiation conflicts for certain benefits that the presence of that capital can generate. That is to say, there is not an anti-extractive discourse in Peru. There are some projects that did stop and that no, surely they will never be revived in two or three regions of the country. But aside from that, the projects are advancing. So what we need is public policy, but for real. Because as I say, in this permanent crisis of government, every time a minister changes, in this permanent crisis of governments, every time a minister changes in Peru, not only the minister leaves, but the vice ministers, the directors, and the entire staff changes. And then it changes again. And this weakens the ability to implement any public policy, right? So I think that's urgent. But could we go into a situation of greater social violence? Yes, I think so. I think that the electoral process should be the way to direct this. I also think that suddenly it became urgent to hold a referendum. It's better to consult the citizens once and for all if they want a constituent assembly or for the next Congress to make a new constitution or, or not. I think in other words, I think it's a subject that should not be abated. I think many people here are scared. They will say no to a constituent assembly because that's going to cause the Peruvian economic boom to collapse. Which indeed Peru, that is, despite all the problems, financially, it does continue to roll. But it's good to face that question, which is a question that appears in every political debate and in every election. Ollanta Humala promised it in 2006, he promised it in 2011, and he won the election that year. In 2016, none of those who were in the second round, Kuczynski or Keiko Fujimori, raised it. But then the subject returned with Castillo and other candidates who also raised it. So let's face the situation, and if the majority says, I don't want a constitutional change, we're perfect. We will continue with these rules. We just make a better government. And if it's considered that there has to be a constitutional change, well, then let's discuss that. What needs to be changed? Because it's a subject that's always there. It's always there. Especially with people outside of Lima, who raise and, and believe that's necessary. I guess it's easier to think in ideological terms rather than the complexity that sometimes is needed. Without a doubt, I believe that in Peru, aside from the social conflict that we have, aside from the struggle for power, I think we have remained in an overly institutionalist vision. In other words, I believe that the institution must be respected and the rules of the game must be complied to. I don't agree with burning a public place, I'm totally against that. But it is necessary to look for solutions within the institutional framework and outside of it.
We can't get caught up and think that's the only thing to do. No. Exercising in politics is required. The big problem in Peru is that politics are not exercised. What we have in Peru are many small diverse groups with diverse interests that come to parliament. Six benches or six party arrive and now we have 12 or 13 split groups. That tells you that interest groups divide them once they get to Congress. A party in Peru, a political party in Peru is just an electoral machine made to arrive, not even to stay together, it's just to get there. And look at the case of the president of the republic, Castillo, who ended up outside the party in which he had arrived to power. And Castillo's vice president, or current president, Ms. Boluarte, it was the same case, both were expelled from that party. So that expresses a bit of institutional fragility there. Without falling into the romanticism of great solutions, what I believe is that in Peru we need very specific solutions that we must begin to implement now, because the discomfort we feel now is not new. In Peru we have seen protests like this one in a different way and a different scale at different times. This time around, they have joined together, but we have already experienced this. We have been on this path for 20, 25 years. And in Lima, especially in the circles of power, it is not fully understood that we must, as I say, take the bulls by the horns, talk to the public, and understand what the citizenry expects.